All right, let's get started. Welcome to Ology, everybody. Eighth episode, maybe ninth episode. Who knows? Um, when this was suggested uh, to me, when we were brainstorming of ways for me to connect with with my audience during this uh, crazy time, this very episode was the one that everyone was so excited about. You know, when we came up with the idea for Ology, they were like, "You could do a bugology, and you know about bugs. It would be amazing." And I've been holding off and holding off and holding off, and I finally, I'm finally giving the people what I want, uh, as my friend Zach says. Uh, this is um, this is an episode that kind of started it all, and I'm glad we're finally getting around to it. In what seems like a uh, an increasingly former life, I was a, uh, a biology major in college, and then I went on to get my master's degree in evolutionary and organismic biology from UMass Amherst. And um, that's just a, a fancy, uh, a fancy name for the program. I was actually studying in insect uh, population dynamics, and uh, before that, as an undergrad, I had studied uh, under uh, a professor at Dartmouth uh, through a, a summertime uh, biology research exchange program, and I spent two summers at Dartmouth uh, under a very influential teacher, um, and uh, kind of got into insect research that way. Um, I've studied. The uh, altitudinal uh, altitudinal gradients and species diversity of uh, leafhoppers uh, in the White Mountains. Uh, I've studied uh, maternal effects on uh, gypsy moth population dynamics, um, and a couple other random uh, contributions to uh, other people's uh, work. Uh, but that was all like 1999 and before, which is a long time ago now, uh, and. I've since gone on to music, of course, um, but the bugs uh, and the science ha have always followed me and have always been kind of certainly part of my life and have kind of slowly crept back into the work. Um, and uh, so love bugs, but I, I, and more in general, I love, I love what bugs can teach us about this wonderful world that we live in. Uh, so it's natural to do a bugology, and I know that there's an actual ology word. We could have called it entomology, but it would have just it wouldn't have it wouldn't have fit in with the other episodes. So um, I wanted to do bugology, and for today's guest, I wanted to try and find someone that combines music and bugs, and I found her. Oh, there's my wife. Hey, babe. Um, today's guest is a research fellow at the Smithsonian. She's a visiting scholar at Dartmouth College. She's a research associate at Cornell Center for Bioacoustics, which is in their lab of ornithology. And she's a banjo player and the driving force be behind the uh, old-timey kind of singer songwriter project, The Littlest Birds. Uh, coming to us all the way from Ohio is uh, my friend Sharon Martinson. And I want to see, oops, I want to see if I can bring her in here. Let's see. There she is. All right. Let's see, if this, let's see if this works. I should turn my volume up. Sharon? Hey, there How you are. How you doing? Trevor, this is magic. <laughs> I know, right? I, I can't believe that this works as I almost dropped my phone. Yeah, and I'm actually borrowing um, my friend's phone. <laughs> I, I have a flip phone. I should actually turn it off. Just. Um, you know, bugs are ancient, and so is this phone. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, Talk about we're evolution. Instagram coming to you from um, a friend's house with good internet. <laughs> That's amazing. That's yes, amazing. Exactly. And you are in Wyoming? I am. I'm in Laramie, Wyoming right now. Laramie, Wyoming. So the, so the internet there is uh, is touchy. It's variable unless you pay to have a business line. Um, oh, oh, okay. Then you get less, you know, fettering of your bandwidth. Yeah. But I don't do that. I well, I appreciate the the uh, the lengths that you went to to to, to be with us here today. Um, well, thanks for let's get this me. let's get this out of the way right 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 up top here. Okay. Which came first, the bugs or the banjo? Oh, what came first, the bugs or the banjo? That's such a hard question. So I thought I was starting out with a softball. <laughs> I guess on the very on the very very beginning of it, I was probably fascinated by insects as a little kid, 
But at the same time, I was introduced to the banjo. It's like the, you know, the gateway drug instrument to becoming a professional poor musician. And my grandfather started that for me. Um, Cause I would go out to the Panhandle of Nebraska over there and um, <laughs> visit them in the summers. And he would let me, let me tune his banjo. He like taught me how to tune it. And I was like, oh, I'm going to be doing Talk about child punishment. Tune that banjo. But in terms of professional, um, kind of like you, I, I went to school with this high intense interest to understand the, the world around me. And as you were also influenced by the professor at Dartmouth College, Matt Ayers, who was yeah. your um, mentor and he was my PhD advisor. I also did population dynamics. So at the same time that I'm like playing banjo chords, my brain also looks at the world as like, you know, a series of complex equations and also beautiful sounds. So they, they don't seem dichotomous at all. I, I love this. We were talking just in full disclosure, we, we had a little conversation a few days ago and, and I wanted to cut it off immediately because I was like, we're wasting all the good stuff. We just need to go like first take. But we talked about this, about how they're not so they're not so different like i get asked all the time like how do you go from bugs and science to art and music you know and you, i think if you, you share my opinion that they're they're kind of they're kind of very similarly similarly related i don't know if i'd call them the same thing or not but it's like you need the same skills to do to do both in a way oh definitely they're related i can think of a, a i 100% agree and I can think of a few ways that they're related like from a mathematical perspective you and I were looking at you said you did some gypsy moth stuff so yeah. I was I was looking at outbreaking insects too like right now there's plagues of locusts in Argentina and these things where you know normally you don't hear about them and then it's like oh my god we have this insect so yeah. thinking of how numbers can be a way to understand the the scientific world around us but then Numbers are also music, right? You know, all the all the notes in the scale are certain sets apart and rhythms and patterns. It's all patterns that could also be put into numbers. But then if you step back and just listen, music is this, it's so much more than just the, the numbers of what it is. And so is the natural world. And so for me, um, being an acute listener is the skill that matches both perfectly. Like, I love it. My job is just to listen, not to hear, but to listen. So. Yeah. Well, and, that, and that's one way, you know, I, I always talk about observation and of course you can observe with your eyes, but, but listening and, and uh, all the senses you can observe with, of course. And I, you, you mentioned at the top there uh, about uh, being, being into bugs as a little kids. I think a lot of little kids are, are into bugs, not that they're not afraid of, of certain ones, but I think a lot of them have this kind of, innate fascination with bugs. I don't know if it's because just as a kid, you're like playing outside where there's more bugs uh, or you're closer to the, the ground level where they're crawling around or what, but I feel like that curiosity kind of gets um, discouraged or dismissed or, you know, you have to kind of put it aside and do something, do something, you know, uh, real with your life or whatever. I feel like biologists hold on to that that sense of wonder and that sense of curiosity, insatiable curiosity, uh, more than yeah. that. I, I think that you hit the nail on the head. Like, there's something about maintaining almost a childlike sense of wonder in the world around you that right. allows you to enjoy it. And also, just to, we were talking a little bit earlier about um, creativity and it's just like being deeply curious curious about like what's going on around you or what happens if I put these two notes together or I've never seen that bug what is it doing or you know that there's just being curious about everything cultivates a mind that is never bored that's for sure <laughs> but yeah. just, there's so there's so much to so much to tap into in the world around us and um yeah the, I don't know what happens uh with kids where we lose that, or it's like suddenly it's like you're supposed to be afraid of anything that has greater than or fewer than two legs, and and you you lose it. Yeah, I kind of do draw the line at like six or or some spot like saltisids are 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 a favorite, like the jumping spiders. Like I'll do oh, eight legs oh, for them, but like anything more than eight legs, I'm I'm deeply suspicious. Like 
you couldn't get it done with six. Like, how many do you need? <laughs> it's very judging on things with more than eight legs. You're like, oh, you're so inefficient with that. You have to have a hundred legs. It's good to do this. Yeah, or like crabs with the 10 legs like hell no i can't i can't do it uh we got an interesting question here i i wanted to open it up for questions later but this is this is an interesting one here um what's your most favorite bug uh and and i don't know if you do you think of bugs in like i like bugs in the sense that i'm interested in bugs and i find them fascinating and beautiful i don't like them in that like I want them like in my bedroom or, you know, like I want to like see them scurrying across the floor of my kitchen. Like I'm fascinated by bugs and I find them, I find them interesting. Like if I, favorite bugs, that's, that's a tough one. Do you have a favorite bug? Well, I, I'll admit right now that I'm deeply biased because I, the animals that I have worked with the most, I have come to, I have come to love. And so even bark beetles, and people are like, oh, bark beetles, they're killing pine trees, they're destroying the forest. And I'm like, no, 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 sweetie. They they belong here, they're native, they're evolutionarily adapted to here. They're doing amazing work cleaning up really bad forestry plants that we've had for 150 years, like <laughs> bark beetles. And they're cute, they're little gloved in tinny. They're just they like, are. they're kind of darling. And um, they, right yeah. now, I guess I'm a, a fickle lover because I have... I have fallen deeply, deeply in love with the tropical katydids. They're just beautiful animals. And we know so little. People are like, oh, how long do they live? How many babies do they have? What did they do in the day? I'm like, we, we don't know anything. Like, they're just a wide open field of like, who are these beautiful, cryptic, just amazing animals? So bark beetles and katydids are kind of top yeah. of my list. Most people are like butterflies or something. Yeah, yeah. Well, that blows my mind, though, that you're talking about just basic biology uh, questions and the stuff that we, our gaps in just basic biological knowledge. Yeah. I find that to be just endlessly fascinating, that there are just things that we have no idea that, what the answer is to. And I, I find it, 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 it like puts, it's inspiring and it kind of puts you in your place and it kind of uh, gives you a little bit of humility or it should. Uh, and it kind of drives, to me, it drives my curiosity. I, I feel like as many questions as you can ask about um, about bugs or as many questions as you can answer, mm -hmm. they only just lead to more questions. You never get, to, it's it's like a PhD you know, project. It's like nobody ever says to you, congratulations, you're, you're all finished. You, what a wonderful job you did tying that up, you know, completely finished. It's like, no, every question leads to another question. And yeah. you just you never get to the end of it. I love that. Yeah, there's something uh, satisfying about that. And actually, so in terms of the, back to your original question of like, what came first, banjo or bugs? And um, after I started Littlest Birds, I toured, and you'll understand this exhaustively, mm -hmm. um, just you know, hundreds of shows and tens of thousands of miles, and. I, I had finished a first postdoc out at University of California, Santa Cruz. I was like, science funding is stupid. There's no more. I'm just doing music. And within two years of doing that, my brain literally felt like some part of it was decaying and falling apart. And it just really wanted to study something. Oh, wow. And, you know, we'd always taken the winters off to you know, roads are bad, there's fear festivals, like just take the winter off, we'd go surfing in Baja for a couple months, write new material, because when you're on the road, you're just, you're playing material you know, and so it was during those winters in Baja where I was like, I started my own research projects, because I was just like, I want to have my brain active on that side again, to be balanced, wow. and so there is something about that, like, endless loop of like, oh, you figured this thing out, let's figure another thing out, oh, look at this, now that we understand a little bit of this, I'm super curious about this part that doesn't make sense anymore. Let's go there, brain. Right. So, yeah. Wow. That's, man, taking the winter off surfing in Baja, I feel like I was musicking all wrong. I don't know. <laughs> I feel like that sounds pretty great. Um, I, I guess if I had to, I, I should, I want to go back to Heather's question about the favorite bugs because I don't, I don't want anyone to say like, you're not taking our questions. I, my favorite bugs, I think, I do really like leaf hoppers and plant hoppers. Um, 
for the same reason that you like bark beetles like they're kind of adorable they don't yeah. sting they don't bite there's nothing i mean some of them are ag agricultural pests i guess but you know they're just they're adorable and um one of the things that I learned from, from uh, Matt Ayers, our, our shared uh, advisor there at Dartmouth, um, he kind of, he was, I don't know if he, I'm sure he didn't come up with this. I think actually it came from, from uh, maybe Bern Heinrich, who we can talk about too. Uh, but I think it's like, wherever you go, there's something interesting to study and there's interesting questions to be asked and to be investigated. So Matt would say to me, like, figure out where you want to be and then go there and find something to study. And uh, so, you know, for me, that's those couple summers, it was like, I wanna go hiking in the White Mountains all the time. And um, yeah. and we would just drive to different mountains and I would take my little kind of aspirator kit, you know, with a little like suction, you can suction the bugs into your collection vial and my yeah. little sweep net and we would, we would just walk up Mount Washington, taking sam samples all, all the way and walk down maybe sometimes two mountains in a day, which blows my mind at this point. I can't even, can't even imagine. But it was like, just go to the go to the part of the world where you want to be, and there's invariably cool things happening there. Uh, and I, I, I found that to be really great advice for, for both science and also, also for music. Like any genre that I, I found interesting or compelling uh, or exciting, you know, even if it wasn't like what people associated with me, I would still go and try and write songs in that style, whether it was Western swing or bluegrass, uh, and, you know, see if I could get my voice into that genre. So I, I kind of took that bit of science advice with me and translated it to music. That's a really cool, I, I haven't thought of it that way, but that's super cool to think about, like, taking, taking the music from different places and being like, that's where I want to be with it. That's and just go go to there. Yeah, this is where I want to be right now. This is where I am right now. I, you know, I did a record of Western Swing. I hung out there for a couple of years. Had a great time. Stopped writing songs about that kind of stuff and in that sort of um, genre, and then kind of just m moved on. And and yeah. I, the same thing, you know, as with leaf hoppers. Like now, whenever I see a leaf hopper, it's like the same thing as hearing a Western Swing song. It's like, oh yeah, I love those things. Nice. <laughs> you can appreciate it. Yeah, exactly. Um, have you ever found, so when you like, obviously you can look at bugs just with the naked eye and you can see just amazing adaptations and amazing, you know, kind of biology just and colors and stuff like that. But when you look at them under a microscope, um, have you, we were talking before about the, the, the notion of resolution of scale, which, which is a really big part of songwriting for me, like how you fine tune your observation to the point of noticing things that maybe other people um, may have only half noticed and, and exploring them. And it's just, I found that like when I put a bug under a microscope, like sometimes you can take a black carabid ground beetle and put it under a microscope. It looks, you know, like a black beetle and that you find under any log, but then under the microscope, you see these tiny little rows along the ridges in the elytra and you see that what is black might have like an iridescent kind of oily sheen to it depending on the egg and it becomes this gorgeous nuanced thing like have you, have you noticed that in the bugs that you study i have there's some uh, definitely some beauty in going down to that scale where it's like here's this really normal looking thing but if we zoom in on part of it here, here's some really lovely feature of it that I that I didn't even notice before. And I think part of what that's tapping into is um, just like when you walk in the woods now and you see a leaf hopper, like A, most people don't notice leaf hoppers. You do because you did that, right? Yeah. But you all sit with a familiarity and you're like, oh, hi, old friend. I know a little bit about you. You're awesome. And your yeah. brain taps into that whole file folder of like, oh, this is all the stuff about leaf hoppers. That's cool. And you can still just carry on with your hike, right? And your yeah. Hike. So that's going down, that's zooming in on the visual scale or the vis with our visual sense, right? Yeah. And so I do some of that. I haven't done a lot with microscope work and the, and the katydids, a little bit for having to ID them. There's a lot of katydids that 
haven't really been ID'd yet. You're st we're yeah. still finding where we're like, wow, this is definitely a new one to science, or at least it's new to this area, or it's undescribed. Like, all right, check it over there. That's going to take a little bit of microscope work. <laughs> Let, I, can, I want to talk about zooming in on the auditory scale because we're musicians yeah. and you started this off as like, you know, we, we'll put a little something in our music and maybe only a few people will ever notice it or find it. Or maybe it's like one of those songs where I still have this. I listen back to an old album I have from the 80s and I listen to that song and I'm like, oh my God, that's what they're doing there. Cool. Like it just took yeah. that. So zooming in using our ears, I can listen to the forest at night right? There's not a lot to see because it's black. Right. And so actually honing your other senses, just like if you had different abilities and maybe you didn't have eyesight, you would hear better. You would have a heightened sense of touch and feeling. So right. trying to really do that. And I do that with the Katie Dids where it's like, go, go through the forest and you actually don't hear them because it's all an ultrasound, but I can record that forest at night. And then when I come back to the lab, the equivalent of sitting under the microscope is taking that and putting it into audacity and slowing it down into my audible range. And I can hear there's an entire symphony of songs going on outside my range. And I zoom in on that by slowing it down. And it's just like, wow, I walked through that forest. And if I didn't know that there was been an entire conversation of the night world going on around me, I would just think it was a quiet, dark little forest. That is amazing. You you sent me this uh, link to an NPR piece um, that uh, that that they did on this, uh, and I'll, I'll maybe I'll um, I'll post that on like my Facebook site or I'll tweet it out or something. But people should check it out. You can hear you can hear the background kind of cricket noise get slowed down and deepen in pitch, and then you hear these sounds that weren't there before in the normal you know span of of human human hearing. And it, it's mind blowing. I, I yeah. couldn't believe that. I always thought that Katie did. Maybe they. Maybe it's different around here. Like here in New England, when I'm listening on a summer night, I'll hear like a very dry, ratchety, short, ratchety sound. Yeah. And I, I always thought that that was the Katie did. And was I wrong about that? Oh, so you do. You're in northern New England, and you do have um, within one of the subfamilies of Katie did. There's some real chatterboxes. And you have those. Okay. So you, they do have a lower. They do have a lower enough pitch that you can hear them as this like grating, raspy thing. I mean, people talk about Katie did the cricket being the singing insects, and it's like, yeah, it's singing until it's two in the morning, and that one is still right outside your window. And yeah. Like, Where are yeah. you? I feel like crickets have like a tone around here. They at least they have like a tone or a note to them, whereas the Katie yeah. did have this kind of kind of more mechanical sounding rasp. I put that detail in a song. The reason I'm asking is like, that, that I put that detail in a song and it's one of my favorite lines. Like anytime I can join my my science and my my music kind of most explicitly, I I think like, oh, that's that's really cool. And so if that line was wrong, I was going to be like, oh. Yeah, so it, it, I, I bet you do have, I bet you're listening to a Katie did. Yeah. Okay. Ever, send it to me, I can try to ID it. <laughs> All right. I saw um, I saw some pictures in that um, in that NPR piece of you with your Katie Dibs in, uh, where, in were you in Panama? Where were you? Yeah, oh, that was all recorded in Panama. I okay. have like in Costa Rica both, but that was that was all Panama. Yeah. I mean, there was like Katie Dibs that are that are this big, and then there were ones like literally this almost as big as your forearm. Yeah. That's crazy. That's wild. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the male. The female would be even larger than that. Even so larger, right? right? Wow. Yeah. That blows my I mean, this is this is an interesting this brings up an interesting thing because when I was in college and then in graduate school, I really wanted to go to the tropics just to, to study tropical biology. There were like several programs that were available through um, my college and as a graduate student. But um, in college, I was I was a tennis player, and I would miss the tennis season, and so I just never went. And then, as a science, as a master's student, I was so intent on becoming, like getting through it and becoming a musician that I never I never did the tropical biology semester, and I always wanted to. Like, a Katie did the size of your forearm. It's like, that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe that. Yeah. 
And do we do we know a lot about the biology of that one? Nope. Like, how long does that one live? How many eggs does it lay? Does it lay its eggs all in one time? Does it mate more than once? Book's wide open. We don't know. I we mean, how do you have a ten-inch-long insect that you don't know anything about? That's <laughs> nuts. Yeah, I, I think that is. Yeah, go ahead. The, the amazing, interesting thing with that, like in the tropics, like on Barrow Colorado Island, where we work, which is maybe like two by three miles, it's not a big island, there's, we found more than a hundred species of katydids. You have a couple in yeah. New England, you know. Um, and so if you go out in the forest to collect katydids, I might catch on a, on a really dark moonless night when there's lots of katydids out. Maybe I'll catch 70 or 80 katydids, and almost all of them will be different species, each one. Maybe a few repeats. Wow. You know? So when it comes to sample sizes, or wanting to be like, well, let's get 100 of that big green species and see what it does. It's like, well, we've never right. seen 100 of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that actually brings up a really interesting point, because... You know, for me, when when I went to, to Dartmouth to, to study under Matt Ayers, um, I was really more interested in herpetology and, and amphibians and reptiles. But there just wasn't as much money to, to study those kinds of things because the, there's generally less kind of economic impact than, say, like agricultural pests or something like that. So there was money for to study insects. And I thought, well, I want to do biology. I'll, I'll study insects for a summer. You know, how bad could it be? Um, and I actually really fell in love with them that summer, um, not just from like a, a, a kind of uh, aesthetic standpoint, the, the beauty that I was talking about under the microscope there, but but also just as a as a tool to to, to kind of go about answering these questions or, or coming up with with evidence to support hypotheses and, and what you were just talking about like sample sizes like I guess the bigger the organism the harder it is to kind of get say a robust um, sample size to uh, to kind of study something and, and get the you know statistics kind of you know mm -hmm. the what we want them to be. And um, bugs are just, they're, they're such a window on, um, they're kind of almost like a, I think of them as like a magnifying glass on, on this, these kind of scientific mysteries because through the lens of, of bugs, I mean, you can, you can get bigger sample sizes so your, your statistics are better. They're um, very uh, kind of variable in terms of um, their, um, the impact of the environment on them, you know, temperature and stuff like that. And you can vary that stuff in the lab. You can rear them in the lab. You know, it's easier to do that, I guess, with like caterpillars than it is than it's long Katie did. Yeah. Yeah, Katie did like to be outside. We can, you know, we can keep them alive for quite a long time in the lab. And they like to eat um, apples and cat okay. food. They'll, they'll do a mix. Okay. Some protein, you know. Wow, okay, yeah. As they're munching along on leaves, some of them are also predatory. There's some Katie dids. I could show you Katie dids that might scare you. There's like... Got big old chompers. Really? Carnivorous katydids, yeah. Um, I have no idea. Oh, yeah. <laughs> is the 10 inch one kit carnivorous? No, but it is, it mostly eats plant, but plants, but it has big enough mouth parts that even yeah. for that, that picture alone, when it got annoyed that it was sitting on an, an arm, it clamped down and was like, oh, I'll show you how I feel. <laughs> wow. That yeah. is, I, I love that picture because, um, you know, because there was something there for for scale. Like I have um, a cousin who uh, who um, they have a, a place down in Costa Rica, and they're always posting bug pictures and like, look at this bug. And I'm like, you've got to put a nickel in there or something, something in there for scale. I don't know how big and, and impressive this thing is. Right. So when I saw an arm, was that your arm? No, I think I took oh. that picture. That was Laurel's arm. And when okay. I worked close, I, I we've both done that pose with that animal because it's so impressive but I think I, I think I took a picture of her arm but we're the same sized human so it really it really is I, in fact I remember a, a, a summer at Dartmouth I think maybe my first summer I found I was walking around and I found uh, a silk moth uh, caterpillar I don't, I don't remember what kind of silk moth it was but I had never seen one before and if for people that don't know silk moth caterpillars are like the size literally the size and the, the girth of your finger, they're huge. Um, and I just was fascinated. I wanted to know what it was. And, and I was 
walking about doing my errands and I didn't have any collecting vials on me walking around town. So I did what any biologist would do. I just grabbed a thing and a couple of leaves and just walked around town with it in my hand, like, you know, like it was a popsicle or something. I remember going downtown Hanover, New Hampshire to some store and um, I was, I needed, needed to buy something and I just had it, had it with me in one hand and I was like fumbling with my wallet with the other hand and the look on the checkout person's face, like, like what are you doing, you know? But for a yeah. bug person, that's just a Tuesday, you know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> the things you would do. Well, yeah. the things you do for science or music. Like, it's exactly. You know, people, people roll their eyes or look and, you know, question your mental health at, at given, any given point in time. <laughs> but walking yeah. into a giant caterpillar, I can totally picture it. If I were the checkout person, I would have been like, oh, yeah, cool, show me. Yeah. So <laughs> I mean, it's it's brilliant, kind of what you were saying about the Katie Dids, like not not really taking to uh, kind of lab rearing uh, this the way that say like gypsum moths did, where you can just put them in vials on an artificial diet and they're they're totally happy. Like in that respect, you really did take that advice to mind. Like the Katie Dids, they're they're in Panama, they're in Costa Rica. I got I'm sorry, I got to go to Costa Rica to to study. You know, that's right. that's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and the, the best time for studying them turns out to be, they, they don't really have winter and summer like we have, but there's wetter seasons and less wet seasons. Yeah. And so during the drier window, um, a lot of the adults are really active and that's what we're finding. And so that also coincides with what has been my my pattern. And I, you know, I, I started doing the, the surfing in Baja. It's been 10 years now since I started Littlest Birds and have always taken the winters to be my sabbatical first for surfing and now for science. Um, and so it's perfect time to do winter science sabbaticals, go down and, you know, Laramie is a wonderful, lovely place, but missing, you know, three months yeah. of the winter, still get yeah. plenty up <laughs> on both ends. Uh, we had a big snowstorm a month ago here in June. Oh, wow. And so it's like, I get, I get enough winter. And then I also get, you know, the tropics and they, they amazed me. I never would have expected being this you know, girl from Wyoming to be, a tropical biologist but there you go <laughs> wild that's wild yeah. um we should uh, let's open this up to questions i know some people have asked um a couple things here um there's a good one here do any of your close friends or loved ones share your passion for bugs and if not have you managed to convince them of their beauty um mm -hmm. uh, has that what's that been like for you well um nobody shares it quite the way I do. I've got um, a, a wide variety of people in my family who are doing all sorts of different things, but nobody is into doing bug science. But I do have to say that I've been heartened that the the young ones, you know, my nieces and nephews mm -hmm. will be like, Aaron, look at this. And so um, my siblings will often send me pictures of, you know, the nebulous black beetle of like, oh, look what Faith found. Look what uh, Jonathan found. The text <laughs> um, pictures, right? Yeah. And you're like, beetle it could be one of any 20 million different species but yeah it's a great beetle, you, know, you know so it's fun to and, and also you know the children of friends like you said it's the children that are more open to it in some ways um okay. I've made, maybe i softened everyone a little bit you know i talk about my house spiders which i'm totally fine with um and you know share share interesting bug stories so maybe there's a little and, you know, in the Martinson clan, there's less squeamish factor of like, ooh, it's a bug. It's more like, oh, cool. I wonder if Sharon knows what that is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have this whole, whole side hustle of people texting me, uh, fellow musicians at all at all hours of the day. Uh, they'll text me pictures of bugs like, um, I found this on my basil plant. Is it, what should I do? Or this was in my house. Should I should I let it stay in my house? And or what is this? You know, it's. Do, do people do that to you? Your relatives do. Do you get that from musicians as well? Uh, some other people, and or on the road if you're like at you know at a, at a festival or hanging out with bandmates. Like, uh, Sharon, what's this thing in the back of the car? I'm like, oh, don't worry, it's just you know this beetle that I found. It'll be fine. Yeah. Right. So a little bit of that. Yeah. I was on a way to a gig once, and I stopped in a rest area in uh, Connecticut. And um, 
the, the family was traveling with me, I think, uh, which they don't often do, but we were stopping, stopping uh, for a pit stop. And on the way back to the car, I, I, you know, like you do, you just scan the vegetation because that's where the interesting things are. And I saw this little tree in the rest area that had gypsy moths and white marked tussock moths feeding in almost like mixed groups. And those were the two of my, my uh, you know, animals that I studied. And I was like, these are the two species that I studied like right here on the same plant at, you know, on the way to a gig, it was like, it was like, like a, a yeah, it's like a sign from God or something. I don't know. Yeah. Good day. Uh, um, <laughs> I have yet another uh, question about um, books about insects and the, the person that, um, was asking was asking for kids uh, specifically and I, I know i think like almost like we were saying like you almost don't even need the books for the kids kids like they're just willing to get out there and go and find yeah. the bugs you know I, for, I think for me it probably started with the very hungry caterpillar like that's i would say eric carl's very hungry caterpillar is a great book classic. Um, but like like you said like getting get, you know they they make little like kitty style aspirators so you can suck up bugs and put them in a little thing and look at them and let them go. Actually just giving them a couple of tools and some, you know, some old cleaned out peanut butter jars to go, yeah. go play outside. Um, and I had a magnifying glass when I was a kid. I actually also had a microscope turned out. Um, yeah. And now I carry around in my banjo case, there's an ambulance in case I see something I need to really look, look at. Nice. <laughs> so oh, yeah, there's amazing. Just well, but for kids, kids, they're already just innately curious, but, um, yeah, very hungry caterpillar. And then, you know, cause I work on Katie Biz, I'll put a plug in for Janelle Cannon's, um, Stella Luna, her story about bats, which is, oh, a bug. Yeah. but like, she, I think she's got, oh, um, I'm blanking on the author name. There's a really great cockroach children's book called Crickling. I oh, love yeah. it. Yep. Crickling like designs his food, but he's got like the, the damaged wing and so everybody. It's the fun. same author as Stella Luna. Yeah, I think that's Janelle Cannon. Is it Janelle Cannon? Yeah. I think, um, I think it's the same author, yeah. Somebody can can double double check that. Yeah, every kid does need a microscope. So um basically anything by Janelle Cannon and she's an awesome woman. She I've she's come down to Panama and we've worked together and Oh no um, way. Yeah, when she's working on, you know, drawing these species of bats and they were looking, did a bat bio blitz and, um, a, you know, just an amazing observer. And she translates that into the most beautiful, accessible little stories for children. So, wow. I think we should probably go a little older too and just say that, like, the kids, you know, they're, they're fine with the bugs, but it's the adults that need the pro need the help getting back into the bugs sometimes. And for me, um, you know, uh, I mentioned him earlier, a guy named Bernd Heinrich. Um, actually, I have, have a couple of his, his books right here. This um, Bumblebee Economics is one that, that I find I found really interesting. And then he's just got a bunch of kind of more naturalist books, like A Year in the Maine Woods. Um, and uh, he's, he's had several since. This was 95 now. Jeez. But, um, he's yeah, got Ravens in Winter. Um, Ravens in Winter, yeah. Yeah. But a lot of his books have these these um, these entomological kind of threads running through them, uh, little kind of uh, tableaus of, of uh, his, his observations on insect life and stuff. Um, also, E.O. Wilson's another good one for like people that maybe aren't you know technical science folk, but that want to read about you know someone that's really knowledgeable about insects and science, but but lays it out there in kind of a lay person's yeah. language. I haven't read it in a while, but I was given the book and I did read it and it was interesting and totally accessible and fun. Like animals are out there doing their thing. Like the only reason I get to hear Katie Biz is because they're singing to find each other, right? To mate mm -hmm. in the crazy chaotic world. And there's a pretty good book out there called Six Legged Sex. And it's all oh. about insects and how they communicate, find each other, how they mate, like, do they lay all their eggs? How do they, how do they raise their young? Or do they just like, you know, send them off yeah. into the world? So that's actually kind of a fun adult or college level book of, oh, these animals are interesting. Maybe it'll pique my curiosity if, if somebody, you know, if somebody wants a more, um, a little bit more of a technical, but not technical fun book to get, to, you know, to get your father back into. 
loving insects, maybe kind of six-legged sex. That's a fun one too. So. Yeah, there's a lot of those um, kind of uh, sexy entomology books. There's the Sex Lives of Animals Without Backbones, which is another another good <laughs> I have. Yeah. yeah, you know, just when you need to spice up your your reading. Um, that's wild. That's awesome. Um, well, yeah. man, this this is okay. fantastic. Crickwing is Janelle Cannon. So basically, anything by Janelle Cannon. Is yeah. Yeah, I forgot her name, but I, and I don't, does she draw the books as well? She does. She's an amazing artist and she, oh. you know, her background is science. And so all of those books are accurate from an ecology and biology perspective. So. Yeah. I loved, I loved those books uh, with my, with my boys and, and the illustrations were, were fantastic as someone that's into uh, to illustration, which actually that might be another good topic for ology. Let's go. I'm right. Draw yeah. We've been working up to bugs and after bugs, I'm like, I don't know what's on the other side. This is like, uh, this is the piece de resistance. <laughs> Drawing. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, well, shoot. Uh, I think I don't see any, many other, I think we got everybody's questions here and we, we've been on for 45 minutes. We only get an hour and I'm sure we have other things to do. So um, maybe I'll just, just kind of uh, let you go and thank you so much for your, for your time today and for, for talking with me about this. Yeah, thanks for letting me join and for getting to connect over bugs and music and science, all of it. I sure hope at some point when the coast is clear, um, getting back to New England um, is one of my favorite favorite places to come, especially in the fall. So. Well, that would be great. Seeing you sometime in person. Oh, absolutely. And this is also affecting your field work too. Like you're not, you're not able to maybe do a lot of that as much as well, right? Correct. So there's no touring and I got pulled out of Panama on the penultimate day of the, the airports were open. Um, oh. going back to the U S um, on a flight and I, I mean, everything that I have is still out in the field. I had my banjo, my laptop, and the clothes I was wearing when I left the island, pretty much. So everything is still sitting out there somewhere in Panama. <laughs> Wait, your banjo is in another country? No, no, no. I had my banjo, my laptop, and oh, my small okay. bag. Everything else is still just down there in Panama. Don't okay. worry. I'll, All right. I'll, I'll stay accounted for. <laughs> yeah. I thought I heard that wrong. Like, oh, my God, that would be horrible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, may we get back to the, to biology and to field research and to traveling and music uh, before too long. And um, thank you so much for your time and for for sharing your uh, your insights on on bugs and uh, and more. And uh, we'll uh, we'll see you real soon. Thanks. You are so welcome. That was great. Take care.